Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Well, good morning, church. My name is Pastor Josh. For those of you who might not know me, I am the executive pastor here at Family Church, but I have spent the last three years of my life very involved in youth. And one thing I learned from the youth, especially between the ages of around 10 to 12, is that you do not understand what true love is until you see a middle school relationship. <laughs> Some of you that think, Oh, I've been married for 50 years happily. I know true love. No. You do not know the true love of the sixth grader in their first relationship. That is the image of true and powerful love. And maybe you were at one time a sixth grader who was deeply in love. I have seen sixth graders that are sure to God of exactly who they're going to marry. But then you ask them a simple question like, hey, what, what, what are you going to do, you think, over the next three, four years? I don't know. I've got the 90-year goal, but I don't have the one-year goal. We see that the trueness of love is found in the relationship of the middle schooler. I remember at one time in my life, I was very much the sixth grader who was deeply in love from somebody. And I realized something very quick that is very important when it comes to middle school love. That middle school love is not just between two people, but it is between two groups of friends that are all intertwined into this relationship. And one of the, I say, the saddest but the most real things that happens every single time is on week one, they're sure they're going to get married. But by week six, I come into church and I say to one of the people, good morning, and they say, hi. I'm like... Everything all right? Yeah. And I go to the other person in the relationship, good morning, hi. Everything fine? Yeah. And they won't say nothing to me, but the whole church service, they're sitting with their friend. The friend is like rubbing their head like, it's going to be okay, baby girl. It's going to be okay. Listen, you is so much better than him anyways. <laughs> he missing out. He missing out on all that. He's missing out. You is the prize, girl, not him. And it usually goes pretty fine after that. There's usually a month, two months where it's like finally the student is back to smiling and back to their old self. And then they get this text from the ex. Hey, I miss you. I miss my koala bear. I miss you so much. And what does a good friend say in that moment? Give me your phone. Don't you there. Do not text your ex back. Give me that phone. And he's like, well, um, you know, he didn't have his Cheetos that day. And maybe it's just, you know, we got, we got stressed out in that, in that moment. We see all the true joys of middle school love. But now that I am at the ripe old age of 26, I have ascended past all of that foolishness. I am way superior. I would never get weak in the knees if one of my exes were to text me right now. And the reason is I have God, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm, I'm to share a few Bible verses on the screen that if you're one of those people who struggle, unlike me, who could ever struggle that way, I'm going to show you a few Bible verses that's going to help you. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go to Romans chapter 3 and see how to not be like you people who struggle, okay? <laughs> how to be more like me. So we're going to scroll down to Romans chapter, ex-girlfriend number one. I miss you so much. Mu <sighs> Y'all know that don't matter. We're going to, to, to Romans. We're going to just back out of there and we're going to scroll all the way down to the book of Romans. Let me get out of your way. Ex number two, bad news. <laughs> You look good online, Poppy, in that burgundy shirt. Caught. Um, we gonna end service a little um, earlier. To Pizza Hut. Forget those other. I'm I'm the one that 
let's, let's pray as we close our service today, okay? <laughs> so if you're wondering today, why are we talking about exes and relationships and middle school love? love? Today we're going to be using it as an analogy the same way that the Apostle Paul does in the book of Romans chapter 7. He uses a relationship to give an analogy and an example of our relationship with God as well as our relationship with sin and our relationship with the law. If you have a Bible today, turn to Romans chapter 7 verse 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation where the Apostle Paul says this. Now, dear brothers and sisters... You who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. As long as what? As long as he's alive. But if he were to die, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So here the Apostle Paul uses this analogy of marriage, of this covenant. And then in verse 4, he explains the point of this analogy. Verse 4, he says, So then, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who is raised from the dead, as a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word. I thank you, God, that as we follow the leading of your spirit, God, that our eyes and our ears and our hearts will be open to receive this word from you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So just like Pastor Mike announced last week, we are going to get into the pinnacle of this, this book of Romans in Romans chapter 8 next week. But as in, in order to do a setup for Pastor Mike, I'm going to be preaching from Romans chapter 7 today. But in order for us to understand what's happening in Romans chapter 7, we have to go back to Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of Romans 6, and then we'll jump right in to Romans chapter 7. And everybody say the word context. Now, when we're looking at Scripture, the reason why we're looking at what's happening before, what's happening after, is we need to understand the context to clearly know what's happening in the passage. And this is an idea that is natural to us. When we look at context, we can think of any point in our lives when we're getting a piece of information where we need more to understand. For example, for any parents in the room, and if you're not a parent, imagine you were a parent. Imagine you get, get, get called down to your kid's school, and the principal says, Hi, Ms. Jones, I just want to notify you that your student has been suspended for the next five days, and they can return next Monday. Thank you for your time. And the principal walks out. What are you going to say? Wait, 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 wait. I need some context. Do I need to strangle my child for doing something wrong when I leave this room? Or do I need to reward them because they were helping out somebody and they got in trouble for doing what was right? We understand that we need context in order to understand how we're going to respond to something. And the same is true in Scripture. So the context of Romans chapter 7 is in Romans 6, the Apostle Paul was talking about how we were slaves to sin. How sin used to have dominion over us. How sin used to have power over us, but the power of sin was broken through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He uses the language of slavery. He says, you who were once slaves or enslaved to sin, you are no longer slaves to sin because you have been set free in Jesus Christ. So when he's talking about our relationship, remember today we're talking about this analogy of relationships. The relationship that we had with sin was that of a master and a slave. Was that of one who exercised complete control over one that was lesser. But when we look into the next chapter, Romans 7, when he talks about our relationship with the law, he switches from a relationship of slavery to a relationship of marriage. 
So he changes the analogy. He's not using as negative of a language when he goes to Romans chapter 7. And we use this imagery of marriage to see how we were bound to the law of Moses. Romans 7.1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So I need the law to come on out. This is Jeremiah. Can we give it up for Jeremiah today? And on his shirt, it says the word law. So what the law represents is God's perfect standard. When God sent the law, he's like, here is all the rules and regulations to follow if you want to be righteous in your own strength. The law represents all the commandments that God sent to his people. And this law is the perfect standard that if somebody was able to uphold it in their own strength, they would be considered as righteous. And using this analogy of marriage, the Apostle Paul here, he is saying that we are bound to the law. He says as long as a person is living, that they are bound to their spouse. So he's saying, as an analogy, we are bounded to the law as long as we are alive. Now, the law, it does not make us sin, but the law reveals to us what sin is. To sin is to violate what God has commanded. The law gave the people in the Old Testament something that they would try to follow after. And we see this in the New Testament with the Pharisees, that they were so proud of their ability to follow the law. No matter who the people were, there was no escaping the law. Everybody say, there was no escaping the law. We were bound to this law. And we see that early on in Romans 7 when he says, the, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as she is alive. So us, we are in my spot today. We are bounded to the law. We were bounded to the law before Jesus. And we see in verse 3 that while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married to another man. In other words, in this adultery, in this analogy, because we are connected to the law, if we were to try to go and be connected to something else, it would be a form of adultery. The Apostle Paul is saying here, we are in this relationship, we are in this covenant with the law. But then he introduces a new thing in the next part of the verse. He says, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And she does not commit adultery when she remarries. So the Apostle Paul is outlining here, the only way to be freed from this covenant is through death. The only way to be freed from this covenant between us and the law is if somebody dies. Somebody in this relationship has to die in order for us to move into another relationship. We were bound to the law. We were bound to the reminder of what we can never do in our own strength. We were bound to a situation in which we had no solution on our own. But then in verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. We died to the law through the sacrifice of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So the Apostle Paul, in this relationship with the law that we once had, he outlines three things. He outlines the what, the how, and the why. What happened? We died to this relationship that we had to the law. How did that happen? Through the sacrifice of Jesus. And why did he do that? That we might bear fruit for God. So the Apostle Paul is being very, very clear here. 
We were stuck in this relationship, in this covenant, but we were set free through what Jesus Christ did. Through the body of Jesus Christ, we were set free from this bondage to the law. And you might be asking today, how is that possible? Where else can we see this in the Bible? Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. The apostle Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what he's saying here is that through the sacrifice that Jesus made, that the Apostle Paul has been set free from this relationship. And I want you to understand today that if Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, you are no longer stuck in this relationship to the law. So we see that the law is something that we were once bound to, but now we can move the law over here and say that it's something that we still can acknowledge, something that we still know exists, something that we know once had power over us, but now we are set free from this relationship with the law. But here's the problem in this. The law gave the people something to try and follow. The law was an outline of something that the people tried to follow. And the Pharisees were so concerned with trying to follow the law, they actually rejected God when he showed up right in their faces. So the people were used to a covenant where they had to try to follow the law and do all the right things in their own strength. But the reality is the law can't save anybody. There is no salvation in the law. There is no grace in the law. We see in Scripture that the law did not bring grace and truth, but that Jesus Christ, that God, was able to bring grace and truth. So because there is no saving in the law, because there is no salvation in the law, because we cannot uphold the law in our own strength, God realizes this and he sets us free from the law. We used to be led by what God created, the law. We used to be led by something that reminded us that we weren't able to uphold the standard. There's this massive gap that needs to be filled. So what does God do? Instead of being led by what God created, come on down, chance, he sends his spirit. And we were set free from this relationship with the law, not to be nothing, but now we are bounded to the spirit of God. So we had this relationship with the law that reminded us that we weren't able to do it on our, se- on our own. But now we're bounded to the spirit of God. So here's the thing about the spirit of God. Many of us might think that we can outrun God. We might think, you know what, I made a big mistake this week. God's abandoning me. I'm going to walk over here. Oh, I said two curse words before church. I'm going to abandon God. I mean, I spanked my kid. I was mad. I ain't going to lie. It wasn't because I loved him. And we try to outrun God, and it's like, oh, you're right here with me? He said, you know what, I'm going to go and do something I really know I shouldn't do. God's going to abandon me in this time, and I'm going to do it anyways. I don't care. I'm at my end. And where's God? Right there with you. He is right there with you in the midst of it all. And the sad part about this is many of us, we have no problem thinking, when I mess up, I'm going to get the consequences of the law. I completely earned it. I completely deserve it. But when God says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you, we still think God's going to leave me if I mess up. The reality is there is nothing we can do to separate ourselves from this new relationship that we're in. There's nothing that we can do to separate ourselves from the love of our God. And that's my first point today, that at one point we used to be bound to the law. 
but now we're bound to the Spirit. We used to be bound to the law, but now we're bound to the Spirit. If you have this mentality that when I mess up, God abandons me, I want you to know you're wrong. You're completely wrong. Because God says in his word that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. There, you don't have enough power to get rid of the Holy Spirit. You don't have power over God to tell him what he's going to do. We can say all day, God, leave me alone. God, abandon me. God, I don't want to be in your presence. And where's God? He's like, oh, my child. I'm right there with you in the dark times as well as in the good times. And we see what happens in this new covenant, in this new relationship with the Spirit as we keep reading in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7 verse 5 it says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. So when we were bound to the law, we were bearing fruit for death. Verse 6, but now, everybody say, but now, now. by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not the old way of the written code. In other words, the law is not our guide on how to live before God. The spirit is our guide. The law isn't the one that leads us now. Now we are led by the Spirit of God. The purpose of the law was to expose what sin was. And this is something that we understand. If, you have, if I had 100 kids that were between the ages of, let's say, 4 and 7 years old, and I told these children, I was like, kids, there is candy in every part of the church. There is video games. You can do whatever you want. But that one door right there, you can't touch that door. Do whatever you want, just don't touch that door. What are those hundred kids going to do? Let's check it out. (laughs) That is our human nature. Where God gives a command and naturally we know it's fun to do bad things. So when God sends the law, it's not that the law was evil, but our natural inclination is to go against what God has spoken to us. And we see this, that now, instead of trying to follow the law, we are now led by the Spirit. The law was once our guide, but now the Spirit is our guide. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, known as the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There is no law against loving those who are around you. And we see this with Jesus when he's debating the Pharisees. And they're trying to press him. And they're saying, hey, Jesus, your disciples are out taking grain. It's the Sabbath. They're not supposed to be working. Jesus says, the point of the Sabbath was for my people. There's nothing wrong with eating on a day of rest. He says to them, how many of you Pharisees that are so against breaking the Sabbath, if one of your animals fell into a pit, wouldn't go and save your animal? There is no law against love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. What the law was to us was a constant reminder of what we couldn't do. The law was a constant reminder of what we're not. But the Spirit of God is a constant reminder of who we are in Christ. The Spirit of God is a constant reminder that God is with us in the good times and the bad. And we see that this new covenant that God sets before us is not about following the law. It's all about bearing fruit. And that's why we see that against the fruits of the Spirit, there can't be a law. The law of the Spirit is that we are bearing fruit. It's not about following rules. It's about bearing fruit for God. 
And the reality is that if you've accepted that Jesus Christ is your Lord, that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is right there with you. But that doesn't mean that I can't look at my ex. They say, wait, I, I look good in a burgundy shirt? Oh. I mean, with the law, I could take pride in my ability to follow the rules. I'm so much better than these other people. Look how much of the law I uphold. Look at these other people. But in the way of the Spirit, there's no boasting in my ability. All my boasting has to be in God and what he did for me. So we have this new relationship with God. The old was a reminder of what I'm not. The new is a reminder of who I am in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to skip down to the end today. But I need us to understand something. That in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I want you to understand that God is not giving you death. That God is not speaking death over you today. That if you feel that God is speaking death over you today, I want you to know you're listening to the wrong voice. If you feel like God is reminding you of all the things that you're not, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, you might not even realize it, you're texting your ex on accident. You're not in the current relationship. You're looking back to the old relationship. You're not resting in God. You're thinking about your works and how you're not able to do it on your own. And you might be here today saying, so how do I navigate this new relationship with God? My first point today is stop texting your ex. Stop texting your ex. I don't care how good I look in that burgundy shirt. <laughs> All right, listen to you. Galatians 5.16, right before Galatians 5.22. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Pastor Mike preached a sermon before where he said, if you're so focused on not doing the wrong thing, you're not even thinking about doing the right thing. You can think to yourself, how do I uphold all these laws? Follow the Spirit. That's it. How do I not do all these things? Follow the Spirit. And it's that simple. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we see the key here is that we ought to be led by the Spirit. Everybody say the key is to be led by the Spirit. But here's the issue with being led by the Spirit. The Spirit is like a GPS. He's not like a self-driving Tesla. He's not going to take control of us and make us turn a certain direction. We want God to take control of us and make us do things when he says, that's not what I'm going to do. But in 300 feet, turn left. But what happens most of the time? Recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. But every single time that we need to recalculate, guess what the Bible says? His mercies are new every morning. We are led by the Spirit of God. And I'm going to close with this point today, that God's eyes aren't fixated on our failures. They're fixated on our faith. God's eyes are not fixated on our failures. They are fixated on our faith. The law was a great reminder of all of our failures. The Spirit is a great reminder to walk by faith and not by sight. And when we walk by the Spirit, we begin to produce fruit. Everybody say produce. Fruit. 
like we just read through all the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. In verse 24 it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It doesn't say crucify like you have to do it now. It's saying that the work was already done in Christ Jesus. If it was up to us, we would mess it up every single time. But because it's based on this new relationship with Christ, it's not about us trying to do more to earn salvation. It's about us resting in what God has won for us. So I want to ask you today, what does it look like for you to produce fruit? What does it look like for you to love those who are around you? What does it look like for you to, to exercise self-control? We have to remember for ourselves that the Spirit is leading us, that the Spirit is speaking to us. It is not a matter of how can I be better, of how can I be stronger, but how can I submit my will to the will of our God? When we give our leadership over to God and follow His leading, you will bear fruit for God. And I love how this all comes together in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where the Apostle Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are in this relationship. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So how do we apply this to our lives right now? You've got to come back next week to find out. Because <laughs> we are out of time. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that in our lives that we would be led by your spirit. That we would give over the leadership of our lives to you, God, Lord. I pray if there's anybody who is struggling with a feeling of not being good enough, of feeling like they're always messing up and causing issues, God. May they be reminded that your voice is not the voice of condemnation, but that you are the giver of life. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would comfort us as we go on. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I would like to pray one more prayer here, and this is called the prayer of salvation. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I'm not in a relationship with God. I'm not walking with the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to pray a prayer, and we believe that if you pray this by faith, that you are now in a relationship with God. Repeat after me. We all say it together. It goes, dear God, come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.